say hello to you and thank you for joining in and watching today. Uh, as you're probably aware, our recording that we did on Sunday uh, did not work, and so we wanted to be able to provide you with uh, the sermon from Sunday so uh, that you can have the opportunity to follow along in God's Word where we were uh, when we gathered together in this building on Sunday morning. Well, we are back in the book of Nehemiah chapter 9, and just to give you a, a little background on where things are, uh, not much really had appeared to be going on spiritually in the life of the people of, of Jerusalem. Uh, we read about them building the wall, we read about other things going on, there, there was sin that was within the community, we don't see a lot of real desire for the Lord uh, at that time, but then God did something unusual among his people there. Uh, we, we said that he visited his people in what we would might call today revival. Uh, not a scheduled meeting, but a time in which the Spirit came and worked, and God just transformed the hearts and lives of the people, moving them from this sleepy quasi-religion that they had to their bones being awakened on fire and fervor for the Lord. And what we're going to read together today is, uh, is really the continuation of that revival. Uh, it started at the beginning of the seventh month. We are still in the seventh month here in uh, this chapter. And what we're going to see now is kind of the continuing phase of that revival where we might call this covenant renewal. Uh, the people had gone on in their sin for so long, had such little religious fervor for so long that they come to the point where they realize they have to be different from this point on. And it has to be a major break from the way things were before this. And so they have come together for this covenant renewal ceremony saying we're going to follow the Lord. It's going to be different uh, from this point going forward. And as we look at this passage, what we're going to see is that the worship of God and who he really is goes hand in hand with confession of sin. Because when we see God for who he really is, in all his holiness and grandeur, then it causes us to see our sin for what it really is. And so because of that, then we confess our sin before him. And, and this passage, honestly, is so rich with truth about who God is and what it means to follow him in repentance that we're going to spend several weeks just on uh, this passage. And even in that, we won't exhaust all that it tells us about who God is. Because what, what we're aiming for in this, this time together and then this upcoming Sunday is to really just to see God, to see God as clearly as we can in his grandeur. Uh, I want you to imagine for just a moment that, uh, that you go out into, into a, a wilderness area far from uh, city lights. You can imagine being out maybe on a mountaintop or in an open field uh, late at night and you look up into the sky and all you see above you is this blanket of stars. It's like you look up and it's almost as if you are amidst the stars yourself because it's all that you see. My aim for this time of studying God's word is for you to look up and just simply see the majesty of God on display before you. And so that all that you see, all that fills your gaze, is the glory and grandeur of God. And now we're going to walk through just a few verses, really, of Nehemiah 9. There's a lot that we're going to see here. So if you're ready for taking notes, I hope that you will have your uh, pen and paper ready because we have eight things I want to show you about who God is just from a few verses in this passage. So get ready. Be ready to take notes. Follow along as I read, starting in verse 1. Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshiped the Lord their God. On the stairs of the Levites stood Jeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shebaniah, Buni, Sherebiah, Bani, and Shanani. And they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashabneah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Pethahiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing 
and, and praise. They are gathered together in worship, and they are gathered together in confession of their sin. And, and so focusing on worship now, who we see God as just on display in this passage, starting at verse 6, I'm going to show you eight things. Number one, he alone is God. I want you to listen to what verse 6 says. It's this prayer of the Levites to God for who he is. It says, you are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them. And the host of heaven worships you. It, it starts out with this very simple statement. That literally, you, O Yahweh, are the only God. You know, we think, well, that's, that's obvious. You know, especially if you've been a Christian for a while, if you've even heard Christian teaching, uh, you hear the statement that he alone is God is just a basic, fundamental, foundational statement that we all know. But the reality is, it is one of the most life-altering statements that we could ever make, that there is only one God, and he is Yahweh, the God who is declared here. It, it was actually one of the most basic statements of the Jews, that, that there is only one God. And the reality is, is that that truth affects everything when we truly understand that he is god and that he alone is god it will radically impact everything in our lives because if that's the case that that's the only thing ultimately that matters is that there is a god and we know who god that god is i, I want you to think for just a moment about how much we make of everything in our lives how often our lives revolve around work and kids and family and spouse and friends and finances and hobbies and other things that we have. Think how much attention goes to those things. But if, if it is true that he alone is God, then our ultimate focus and attention must be on him. It impacts everything else in life. And so that's number one. Number two is he created everything look again in verse six here they're starting out with these most basic foundational principles that you are the lord you alone and then a statement about creation you have made heaven the heaven of heavens with all their hosts the earth and all that is on it the seas and all that is in them i mean again if we have heard christian teaching if we've heard sermons we've been in sunday school we, we've heard this the whole time that we have been in, in church. Of course, we know God created everything. But let me back up for just a minute and just ask the question, why, why would they start with this? Why, why would they start off this prayer of praise to God and confession of sin with the basics of God's existence and God's creation? Well, if those two things are true, then it flips everything upside down it, it, and here's what i mean by that in, in the human world view humanity and particularly the individual becomes what is the focus of our world view Th there's an inward orientation to the human heart where our lives become about us you know it's the reason that we never have to teach a child to be selfish to be self-oriented because it's ingrained in their hearts it's the same for those of us who are older as well, that our hearts naturally point inward to ourselves. But the doctrine of God and the doctrine of creation points us away from ourselves to the one who is ultimate, because it is, it is not ultimately about us, what we desire about our own lives. It is ultimately about him and his glory. That's why it all begins here with God and the fact of his creating everything so number three now we're continuing with with doctrine of god here god alone is god he created and now number three he preserves creation and so at the end of verse six you see explicitly stated here you preserve all of them and the them there is referring to the things that he created so not only did god call it all into existence but he upholds it by the power of his mighty right hand to keep it existing. Now, some of you may be familiar with a religious philosophy called 
deism. It was very prevalent in the 1700s. Many of the, the founding fathers of the United States were deists in one way or another. And, and deism states that God created everything, but he created it in such a way that it's almost like a pocket watch that you wind up. Uh, that he wound it up, got it going, and then let it go just to run by its own natural uh, processes, natural laws. Well, that is not the doctrine of creation according to Scripture. God didn't just call everything into being, then step back and let it go. Instead, God called it into being, and then he continues to uphold it in being by his own power. Whereas if he were to remove his hand from creation, it would just simply cease to exist. So he preserves all of his creation. So then that leads us to number four. Number four is he is exalted by creation. There's one final statement there in verse six that's incredibly important for us to, to see. It says there that you preserve all of them. And then finally, the host of heaven worships you. Now, that phrase, the host of heaven, probably here refers to uh, the stars in, in the sky. It says that those stars in the sky exalt the Lord. Now, uh, we use this imagery of looking up at the night sky and seeing all the stars up in the heavens. Uh, when an ancient person would look up into the sky, they, they would look up and they would see those stars and not really understand that there were more stars beyond that. And so it was common to try to count how many stars there were. So a man by the name of Ptolemy, who lived about 100 years after the time of Jesus, so uh, lived about 500 years after the time of Nehemiah, he looked up and tried to count all the stars in the sky. And he counted 1,056 stars. Uh, and there were various other counts that were done throughout the centuries, really, until the time that we had telescopes and could look and see that there were far more stars in the sky than that 1,056. Now, astronomers today give varying es estimates of how many stars there are, I, but one that I read was one followed by 24 zeros. So just an almost unthinkably huge number of stars that exist in the universe. And one, one astronomer even postulated that perhaps it's just infinite, that, that it just goes on and on and on. Now, we have to ask the question, why would God create so many stars? Why would God create a universe that is so massive that there are stars that go beyond really what we can physically number? Well, the purpose is found right here in verse 6, that that host of heaven, those stars, exalt God. He created all of that and the vastness of the universe to show off how great and mighty he is. Why is it so large and so many stars? Because God himself is so mighty and glorious beyond any comprehension. There must be such a huge universe to declare how big and glorious God is. It's the reason that Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. It shouts out how glorious and great and mighty God is. So if that's the purpose of the stars, then is that not the purpose of your life as well? That God created you specifically for his glory. It means for you to see and know his majesty and his grandeur. To show forth his greatness through your life. Now, that leads us then to number five. And this is where we're moving from the God who is out there to the God who is near. This transcendent God above everything is also the eminent God who comes near to us. Because number five is that he is the covenant-making God. Okay, so he is the covenant making God. Now there's a lot that we've already seen in just this one verse so far. So I want to move on to verse 7. I want you to listen to what it says here about who this God is who spun all the universe into existence. Verse 7, you are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made with him the covenant of 
to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite. You have kept your promise, for you are righteous. Now it says there that God made a covenant with Abraham. Do you remember what a covenant is? A covenant is it's this binding legal declaration. Uh, it, it's, it's this binding promise that is, that is made. Uh, and so you remember how this happened with Abraham. Abraham lived in, um, in uh, Ur. Uh, brought, it says it brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans, gave him the name Abraham. But if you remember the story of Abraham, was it that Abraham was the one seeking after God? Or was it that God was the one who called out to Abraham? What we see in the text in Genesis 12 is that it's God who reaches down and calls out to Abraham. The same thing happened later in Genesis chapter 15 where God reaches down to Abraham. You, you might remember this passage in which there is uh, there's this point where Abraham is going to be offering sacrifices uh, to God that there are essentially um, these animals that he sacrificed, they've been cut into two different pieces and put into two different piles. And Abraham falls into this, this deep sleep vision in which he sees this torch and this smoking pot, that this fire pot, that go in between those two piles of animals. And in it, God is creating a covenant with Abraham. Now, who made that covenant? Was it Abraham who was making it? No, it was God who was initiating and who was making this covenant with Abraham. So I don't want you to miss how amazing this is. The God who created everything, who called everything into existence, this multitude of stars that go beyond anything we could possibly number all that done for his glory reaches down to the man abraham to make a covenant promise to him how amazing is it that god reaches down to us so as you're listening right now i don't want you to miss just how powerful that truth is this is not a god who merely spun everything into creation as as great as that would be we're speaking of a god who comes down to people and says that he will redeem a people for himself he is that covenant making god who calls out a people for himself. Let that truth echo through your mind and heart and let it cause you to worship God who calls out to us. What an amazing truth that is. But it's not just that God makes a covenant with Abraham. We now have number six, that he keeps his promises. He keeps the covenant that he makes. So again, let me, let me read verse 8 to you again. Listen to this. It says that you found his heart faithful before you, and you made the covenant to give, his land, uh, to give him the land from all these different peoples. And then at the end of that it says, you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. Yeah, there, there are two different kinds of covenants, essentially. There's what we might call a conditional covenant. And, and that's a... That's essentially a contract that has different stipulations for each party. And if one of those parties fails to keep that, that covenant, then the covenant is essentially null and void. And, and we're familiar with different kinds of contracts today. One, one of the most common contracts that, uh, that we have, that many of us are familiar with, is, is a mortgage. You know, if you have a mortgage on a house, basically what has happened is you and, a, and the bank have drawn up this covenant where they promise that they are going to pay so that you can live in that house. They basically pay the cost of the house, and your side of that, con that contract is that you are going to make monthly payments 
to eventually over 10, 15, 20, 30 years pay off that mortgage. Now, this contract, though, is not unconditional. It has conditions with it. So that if you fail to pay your mortgage over a series of months, you know what's going to happen, right? You, you don't get to stay in that house because you are forfeiting that house because you have failed to carry your end of the bargain by paying that monthly payment. God's covenant, though, particularly God's covenant of redemption that we might speak of, doesn't work that way. God made a plan to redeem a people for himself, and he will redeem a people for himself. I mean, I want you to think for just a moment about Abraham. A Abraham was far from perfect. I mean, do you remember the incident where Abraham was going into Egypt? Uh, th this is also in, in Genesis. Abraham's going into Egypt, and we see Abraham speaking to his wife, Sarah, and he tells her that she is beautiful. That's a, that's a great statement that he makes. But then the very next thing he says totally negates all that he's trying to do because he isn't just simply saying that she's beautiful because he, he loves her. Instead, what he says is, you're beautiful, and when we go into Egypt, they're going to see how beautiful you are, and they are going to kill me and take you because you are so beautiful. So we need to come up with a plan so that I don't get killed. So here's the plan that he comes up with. Well, you just say that you're my relative. And that way, they won't think that you're my wife, and then they won't kill me. And so the very next thing that we see is Sarah is in Pharaoh's household, Abraham has profited greatly because Pharaoh's given him tons of camels and cattle and, and other things. So Abraham's doing fantastic with all the wealth that he's gained, but there his wife is in the household of Pharaoh. Abraham has blown it completely by his sin in this situation. But even with that, God did not end the covenant that he had made. By his grace and mercy, that covenant continued on because it wasn't dependent on Abraham. God's covenant of redeeming a people for himself is dependent on God, not our ability and what we do. If it was dependent on our faithfulness, we would be utterly doomed. But it is dependent on God and his faithfulness. So church, hear this. God's promises are contingent on God. They are not contingent on our abilities. And thanks be to God that that is the case. So you who are a believer, who are watching and listening right now, rest in God's promises. Rest in his word. Now, this doesn't mean that God is always going to lead you to easy times. It doesn't mean that all, God's always going to bring some kind of victory in your life. What it means is God will always be faithful to his word. That may mean you go through very difficult times. It may mean it leads to something with your ultimate death. But God will always, always, always be faithful to his word and faithful to his promises. Now, again, thinking about how we've how we've been moving from this God who is out there, creator of everything, to this God who draws near. Now we come to number seven. He sees his children. So part, part of what's happening in this prayer is, is the Levites who are praying this are recounting the history of what God has done in Israel. And it's an extremely God-oriented prayer, which is really the way all of life should be, the way our prayers should be. They're, so they're rehearsing what God has done. And this is something we see over and over in the Old Testament, again in the New Testament, just this looking back to remember who God is and what he has done. It's like what we said last week. We have to look back before we can look ahead to remember who God is and remember his faithfulness. So in the passage that we are, uh, that we're focusing on here, we're remembering uh, 
that God looked down and saw his people. So if you go to verse 9, here's what the Levites pray. They say, you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea. So God looked down. Remember, remember what happened where the people of Israel were enslaved in Egypt. God looked down and he saw their suffering. He, he, saw, he saw how they were being oppressed. He saw how there was the threat of the death of their children. He saw all that that was happening there. And what's unspoken in this is that not only did God see them, but God cared for them. I want you to go back to that image that I gave you at the beginning of this time where I said, just to imagine that you're out in the field or on top of a mountain, far from anything, and late at night, and you're looking up, and all you see is the blanket of stars above you. But I want you to imagine that, picture that. You look up, you see that. You see the, really the, the infinite majesty of God essentially laid out before you. But at the same time as you look up and you see that, you recognize and remember that that God who is creator of all that, he looks down and he sees you. He sees your life. He sees everything that you're experiencing. He sees the heartache. He sees the challenges. He sees your efforts. He sees and he cares. Now, I say that not to magnify you, but to magnify God. Because how amazing is this God? If he is that great and mighty that he created it all, that he upholds the existence of everything by his hand, and yet he still looks down with care and love on his children. How great is this God who we serve? But not only, not only does he look down, but number eight, he hears the cries of his children. Let me read verse nine to you again. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea. Now again, this is, this is a passage that you probably remember where uh, the people of Israel are um, next to the Red Sea, and then you remember the miracle of how God parts the waters, and they're able to go across on dry land, and then the waters come back on top of Pharaoh's army and, and crushes that army. God rescues the people of Israel um, out of that slavery and is leading them away from Egypt. Now, there are some important details in this verse for us to see in order for us to get what is being told to us here. So, do you remember the specifics of what happened? God had led the people of Israel out of slavery, and as they're going away, God tells them to, to turn back a different direction. And God leads them to this place where they're basically backed up against the Red Sea. There's, there's nowhere else for them to go. And, and you remember what happens after that. Finally, uh, Pharaoh hardens his heart again and says he has to go back and get those people. He has to have those Israelites back. So he sends his army after them. And so the chariots are going, thundering after the people of Israel, and you've got all of the soldiers who are going after them, and there's the people of Israel stuck at the Red Sea, nowhere that they can turn. And it says there that God heard their cry, at the Red Sea. Now this immediately sounds so good to us. They're there, they call out to God and he hears them. But I want you to, to know more of the details of what's going on because those details so enliven the passage for us to help us see what's happening. So this is in Exodus chapter 14. We start at verse 10 and this is what it says. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. They saw all 
that army coming at them, and they knew that there was nowhere that they could turn. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. Now, this sounds good and right, doesn't it? They, they see that there's no hope in and of themselves, and so they just call out to God right there. But then when we see the next few verses, we see that, that calling out to the Lord isn't simply just this full of faith prayer. Because here's what it says. The very next verse in chapter 14, verse 11. And they said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Weren't there graves back in Egypt? Why did you bring us out here so that we would die next to this sea? You see, that cry that they have of crying out to God isn't really a cry full of faith. It's a cry of fear with just a small amount of faith mixed in. So why would Nehemiah be recording this for us? Why would the Levites be recording this particular moment where God heard their cry at the Red Sea when it is such a moment of not example of faith, but fear and complaining from the people? Well, here's here's why, I think. It highlights the grace of and majesty of God because God heard them even when all they could do is cry out with a small amount of faith primarily driven by fear God still heard and so what I want you to remember now is that even when your faith is weak even when your faith is small and All you can do is call out help. God hears the cries of his children. How how great and awesome is this God? How much should it be that we just look up and all we see is the glory and grandeur of God? We get so focused on our own lives so often the things that are taking place in our life we look at those things rather than looking up and seeing it is all is all about the glory and grandeur of god so today that's my aim is for you to look up and for you to see that to simply to see who god is you know in the in the 1700s John Wesley, a man that you probably remember the name of, started services that would be on um, New Year's Day or New Year's Eve and what have continued on to this day, and they're often called watch night services. And it was, it was a time of basically uh, almost a covenant renewal with the Lord where the people would gather together and put their attention on the Lord and focus on living anew for him giving their lives wholeheartedly to him and john wesley wrote a prayer for those watch night services this is what he this is what he wrote for for this prayer says i'm no longer my own but yours put me to what you will rank me with whom you will put me to doing put me to suffering let me be employed by you or laid aside for you exalted for you or brought low for you let me be full let me be empty let me have all things let me have nothing i freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal and now O glorious and blessed god father son holy spirit you are mine and i am yours so be it the covenant which i have made on earth let it be ratified in heaven May it be that this would be our prayer. That as we see the glory of God, as we look up and all we see is His majesty, 
May it be that we would have this prayer that we say, I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and your disposal. As we see and recognize, it is ultimately all about him, not about us. Let me pray for us. God, we pray that we would hear the truth of who you are. We pray that you would be truly exalted. Exalted in our lives, exalted in Frederick, exalted across this world for who you are. And God, help us to pray with this prayer that we yield all things to your pleasure and disposal because it is all about you. Help us, Lord, to have that attitude. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And that is my prayer for you, for each of us, that we would so fully see who God is that we would yield everything unto him. Now, for those of you who are, who are part of Frederick, I want to share just a couple things with you uh, about uh, important things for you to be aware of as we continue to, to move forward. Uh, at the end of July, the week of July 27th through the 30th, uh, was when we had our Vacation Bible School scheduled. We're not going to have the typical Vacation Bible School. Instead, we're going to do something a little different where we're having a week that we call Mission Possible, where we are providing mission activities, mission projects for kids to do with their families. And so we are going to be getting information to you about that and how kids here can be involved in those mission projects with their families at home and out here in the community. But we don't want it to be something that's just uh, with the kids, but something that is church-wide. So we are extending this to the whole church and we're going to be encouraging the whole church body to be involved on mission together. And we're going to provide you with specific ways that you can do that. Something different every day to be engaged on mission here and learn about mission to the ends of uh, the earth. And so I want you to be looking forward and anticipating that. Uh, we're also praying through and discussing uh, how we can restart community groups here on campus and what that'll look like. So we'll have more information to you soon about the, how we can do that. And then also we are uh, continuing to have more and more things happening here on campus. We've got uh, men's and women's Bible study that's happening on uh, during the week here on campus now. Our Wednesday, Bible, uh, Wednesday prayer time. Uh, is going to be meeting again on campus, uh, 6.30 in the atrium. invite you to be a part of that. And, and so we are just continuing to take steps ahead uh, in just an unusual time uh, as we seek to be faithful to how the Lord is leading us. And so I pray the Lord's blessing on you, and may you have a great week as you continue seeking to follow after him. Lord bless you.